helping lead the service this uh, this evening. We appreciate that. And uh, I think you, you hit those high notes very well. <laughs> I won't repeat what I accidentally said this morning. All right, I'd like you to take the Word of God and turn with me to the book of Ephesians again tonight. The book of Ephesians. And I've been preaching... Uh, We'll be praying for the children as they go back again tonight. So glad to have them all with us tonight. But I'm going to be preaching. I, I preached uh, last Sunday morning about the family of God, and I preached this uh, this morning about uh, our families where we live. But uh, tonight I want to talk about reaching out to those who are outside of our families. Ephesians chapter four. Ephesians chapter four. This is. Uh, this is a message that, uh, just a thought that's been in my mind, this, this particular thought, this particular verse. Ephesians chapter 4, verse, we're going to start reading at verse number 12, but emphasizing verse number 15. All right, let's start reading it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love they grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body uh, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the Word of God which opens our eyes, which is light in the darkness. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the light that we may shine as cities on, a city on a hill. Uh, we, you, you told us that we are the light of the world. I pray that we, can't, that we won't hide that light, but that we'll take it and, and shed it abroad in the place where you've put it, uh, our church, but also in the place where you've put each one of us as Christians in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities. Father, help us to realize our, our, uh, our great privilege and our responsibility to do that. And uh, Father, help us and strengthen us. Give us the strength and the wisdom that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now the uh, Apostle Paul here, he, was, he, had a, he had a ministry. He had a ministry of traveling, and, but he didn't just travel. And uh, he, was, he wasn't just traveling, doing things willy-nilly all over the place, but he was traveling with a specific goal in mind, and that goal was, was found here in verse number 15. This was his goal, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. Now, Natalie, uh, right before the Bible Club started, our holiday Bible Club, she said, she said something to me, and she said, uh, uh, I want to give my life to, to spreading truth, to spreading the truth to other people. And uh, that's what we were able to do, spreading some truth, getting some foundations in there to build upon with children in the Holiday Bible Club. And I, I'm so glad to hear her say that, and that's what I want, I want to give my life to as well, giving people the truth. There's so many things out there that, that uh, there's so many winds of doctrine out there, there's so, many, so much deceit, there's so much slight, as it says in verse 14, there's so much craftiness. There's people who lie in wait to, to deceive. And yet, we are supposed to go out there and do the opposite of that. We're supposed to go into this world and give the truth into those people's circumstances, into those people's lives and situations. And that's the most important thing that Paul said he could do. When he came into Ephesus here, that's what he had done. He had come into this city, this huge city of Ephesus, that was known for its idolatry, that was known for its wickedness, and for its, uh, for its worshiping of Diana, is what it was known for. And uh, this, this was a, a great commercial city, 
The Bible records that for us here in, uh, in, the, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 19. And we'll definitely be coming back to Ephesians here in a few minutes, but why don't you turn with me to that, uh, that chapter, Acts chapter 19, and we'll look at how Paul had demonstrated this. He had, he had gone in. He had gone into this situation of this, this uh, huge city and preached. Acts chapter 19, verse number 8. Acts chapter 19, verse 9, this tells us what he did after he entered into Ephesus and preached. It says, And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So there he was in Ephesus for three months in a synagogue. There was uh, people who had a foundation, and he was going to build upon that foundation there at the synagogue. You know, there's some people in, in Ephesus who were going to be reached, who were totally heathen. They were totally away from God, but they had no foundation. And he was going to reach them, but he started with the people who had a little bit of a foundation about the Old Testament, about who God was, about the one true living God there at the synagogue. So he goes there, and he's able to build upon that. There are those people in this country who have a little bit of a foundation. They know that there's a God. They know, they have a respect for the things of God. There's not as many, for sure, as there used to be in this country, but there are people who are like that. But they are blown around with all sorts of things, but he says he builds this foundation here in Ephesus with, what does he build it with? With the truth. He speaks boldly for three months, disputing, persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. He's trying to build something here. So he's in Ephesus, it's a, it's a seacoast city, and it was a commercial city. It was one of the, uh, it had one of the great wonders of the world, uh, one of the wonders of the ancient world, and that was the Temple of Diana. And they say that that temple to Diana, to the goddess Diana, it took them 200 years to build the temple to Diana. 200 years of sweat and, and probably slave labor and all these things, and yet... Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a people, it's a city that's filled to the brim with this superstition. And with, uh, it, they were already religious, but it was a false religion. They, there were people there who were Jews, and I'm, they were Jews in that city in Ephesus. And so he goes to them, he tries to, to put some truth into that place. The truth of the gospel. And uh, just imagine, it, it, as we read here, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, we learn more about it. It was this place where uh, demonic activity was going on. It was a place where sorcery was happening. It was a place that greatly resisted the gospel when it came. But it was a very important city, and it was the gateway to Asia Minor. And so here the man of God goes. He's just goes all, you know, just one man of God armed with the word of God, the truth of God. And he went in there, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, and he declared the message of God to those people there in that awful place. And he, he planted a local church in those three months. And he, uh, he, he planted um, there in the first century, and he, he spent that time. I'm sure it wasn't easy. It says they use his words here like disputing, persuading. That must have taken a lot of mental work. To do that, but God, God was able to give Paul, with the Word of God, with the Holy Spirit's help, the wisdom that he needed, the strength that he needed to be able to do that. And there he gathered the core group of people; they were seeking the truth. And then the Bible says, in verses nine and ten, it says that he went on. It says, "But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude," I'm talking about. The, Christ, the early Christians were called the way. That's one of the names for early Christians. When they spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples. So there were a, a group, a core group of disciples. He separated them, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks. So Paul spent three months in the synagogue, 
And the opposition became so intense that he took the disciples that had been made during those three months. He rented a hall and he stayed there for two years. And uh, uh, it wasn't just meeting in that hall, but the Bible says they were launching out from that place. And they were going into all of Asia. It says, all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord. So it was a meeting, but it wasn't just a meeting. It was a meeting to try to get become a center for evangelizing all the other areas. See, when we come to church, it's not just for a meeting, is it? It's supposed to be a center from where we go out to take the truth to other people. And, and uh, he, that's what he did. And in two years, what happened? This is amazing. In two years, all of Asia heard the gospel from that place. And so he really must have been equipping these people. Uh, imagine if the Apostle Paul was, was your pastor for two years. That would be a pretty uh, amazing equipping. But you know what? We have the same word of God. In fact, we even have uh, more of it than they did. Uh, of course, we have uh, all the whole completed word of God. We have the, the Holy Spirit, and God works the same. Every, just as we sang a few minutes ago, Daniel found him faithful, Elijah found him faithful. It's the same God, Jesus. We have the same promises. So they were starting these churches. But then, of course, the devil doesn't like this. So in, in verses 18, 19, and 20, it says that, uh, and, and many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So there was such an impact made. There was this great gathering of people and people got, brought all sorts of things to be burned. Uh, books and I'm sure other things as well. They piled them all together. Probably idols because this was a place where idols were, were rampant. And uh, there was such a great uproar that uh, there was a silversmith, silversmith, and he made a little, little idols of the goddess Diana. And he started to say to the other silversmiths, he said, this man, he's causing such a disturbance. These people are coming to Christ, and, and we need, you know, he's taking away from our business, you know. Uh, the materialistic... Uh, uh, objections there, but the, the temple of Diana wasn't just a place where they worshipped Diana, it was where they had all sorts of business that went on, it was the market the market center, it was the, the city center, the, the temple there, and the whole city was being impacted by the preaching of this man Paul, and so they said we have to get rid of this, this crowd uh, that's coming to the Lord Jesus. You know, I'm sure if we were to really really get to the heart of giving people the truth, I'm sure it wouldn't be a smooth road for us. If we were giving people the truth in such a way that lives were being transformed, that people were being, people, the, the, the city was being turned upside down, I'm sure the devil wouldn't like that at all. It would cause a disturbance. If we didn't have any problems, we probably because we're not doing anything for the Lord. And so the Bible tells us that this first century church made a difference. There, it was, uh, was Christ-like. They were speaking the truth. They were doing it in love. And the most wonderful thing about a church, and I've said it before, it's not the size of the church. Of course, the bigger the church, the more people we're reaching. But that's not necessarily what makes a, a church a, a Christ-like church. People try all sorts of things, don't they? What makes a great church? Is it a great choir? Is it a great production? Is it a great show? Is it, uh, is it the size? Well, no, a great church is its likeness to Christ. Its likeness to Christ. And any church can do, do that, whether big or small. The likeness to Christ. And so, is our church, what did Jesus do? He spoke truth. It didn't make everybody happy. He spoke truth to the Pharisees. But he did it in love. He did it with tears in his eyes. And that's what Paul was trying to do as well. Speaking the truth in love. Everything... Everything about this, this church in Ephesus was, uh, was, was advancing the gospel of Christ. And so, in, back in the book of Ephesians, back over here, it says that uh, that's what he had done there. And uh, the Bible tells us that um, here in this book, he's trying to uh, equip these Ephesian people even more. 
So now Paul has left them. He was there for two years, but I'm sure he's still burdened about them. And this is one of the prison epistles, Ephesians is. So now he's in prison, but he's still trying to equip them to do the work that God's given them to do. And so he says, God's given you everything you need. You don't need me anymore. God's given you all these things to get the work done. Now go out there and do it. Keep going out into Ephesus. Keep going out into the city center of Ephesus where the temple of Diana is. Keep doing it. And, uh, and speak that truth in love. And he says, God's given you what you need. Look at chapter 4 again of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. Backing up a little bit in the chapter. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7. It says, But unto every one of us, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of, of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first in the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. So this is the one who's giving these things, and look what he's given, verse 11. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ that we be that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth in love may grow up into all things which is the head even Christ so this beautiful passage of scripture here it has to do with this church this Ephesian church. And he's telling them, you have everything you need, but you're not there yet. He said, you have everything you need, but you still have some growing to do. He said, he says here, you're supposed to be speaking the truth of love. You're supposed to be the body of Christ. He goes on to talk about that in verse 16. The whole body fitly joined together. We've talked already in the past weeks about how the church is, is a, a flock. We've talked about how it's a building. And we're all different parts of that building. We've talked about how it's the bride of Christ this morning. But here it says that the church is like a body. And the Lord Jesus Christ is not on this earth anymore. He's up in heaven. So how does, God, how does Christ work? How does he continue to work in this world? Well, he does it through the local church. And he says, I want this body, this church, to be fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint Supply it according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. I want it to work. I want it to be effectual. I want the church to do its job, and I want it to. I want it to change people's lives. I want it to be able to make a difference, continue to make a difference, not only in Ephesus but in all of Asia. I want it to be. I want it to be powerful, just as God's God's work can be. And so, he says. He says there's some certain things. He, when Jesus Christ was on this earth, he, he, um, he left a local assembly of baptized believers who voluntarily joined themselves together to carry out the Great Commission in our, in our Bible school. We gave you that definition of a church, and hopefully you can say that definition back to, back to me uh, if, you, if you keep thinking about it. What is a church? It's a... It's, uh, well, today, uh, Jonathan's family was at our house, we played a game called Apples to Apples. And uh, one of the things that was in that game was the activity, it said going to church, and then it gave the definition of a church, what Apples to Apples said that the church was. And Jonathan, do you remember what the definition was that Apples to Apples says the church is? It said um, weddings, funerals, bazaars, and bingo. All right, weddings, <laughs> funerals, bazaars, and bingo. So that's the world's definition of the church. But what is the Bible definition of a church? A group of baptized believers who voluntarily join themselves together to carry out the Great Commission, the things that Christ has given us to do. And so that's what a church is, and it's His body. 
here on this earth. But he says, I want you to come in unity and knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And in verses 14 and 15, he says, I don't want you to be children. I want you to be strong. I want you not to be carried away, but I want you to grow up into all things, which is the head, even Christ. Be a, a mature church. There's so, so, so many churches that are so, they're so shallow, aren't they? They're, they're 100 miles wide, but they're two inches deep. And that's not what Christ wants of a church. He wants us to, to know Him and uh, to know what's, what's the, the important things in, of the matter. You know, we're, we shouldn't try to be a 21st century church. We should try to be a 1st century church. Try to get back to the, to the primitive uh, beginnings of what it's all about. What does God want us to do? And that's the Great Commission. That's what He gave the church to do. And there's lots of other things in the New Testament that go along with that. But the Bible says that we come to this place where we have unity of the faith. We have... We have not only unity, but we have the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, people are always talking about unity, which is good, to be able to be united. But he says, I want you to be united, but I want you to have the, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Don't just be united over anything. Don't, don't be, don't, uh, that's not the main thing. The main thing is that you are whole, that you're complete in Christ. And then, if you're, if you're both complete in Christ, you can, you can have unity. And I've said it before, I love that song, uh, Onward Christian Soldiers, it says, One in hope and doctrine, one in charity. So we can work together in charity to get things done to help people. If we are one in hope and one in doctrine with other Christians, then we can work together with them. Uh, but you can't sacrifice doctrine, of course, as you know. But he says... Uh, um, he says uh, in, here in Ephesians chapter 4, he says in verse 13, unto the perfect man, the measure of the stature of the fullest. Of, we're not going to be perfect. If you ever find a perfect church, you better not join it because you'll ruin it. Uh, because there is no such thing as a perfect church. But he says, I want you to grow up into a perfect man. Try to become, try to meet the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're supposed to be like Jesus Christ. That's what I said, is the measure of a church. That's the measure. So every part of life should be yielded to Him. We're supposed to be like Him. We should function the way He would function in the earth. And we're supposed to, uh, the measure of our ministry is the likeness to Jesus. So, so uh, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us certain things. Uh, Paul's preaching and teaching. He's, we find the unity here, and he says that... Um, in the church, in all that, there's different parts. In order to accomplish God's goal in the local church, the Bible says that He gave some apostles, He gave some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. So you know, that first one, apostles, He gave some apostles. What's an apostle? Well, you might say, you might have met somebody who says that they're an apostle. Of course, the, the biblical definition of apostle, uh, an apostle is an eyewitness to the resurrected Christ. That's what an apostle is in the New Testament. Someone who witnessed the resurrected Christ. So it includes the disciples, but Paul also witnessed the resurrected Christ there on the road to Damascus. So he was an apostle as well. And so, I don't think there's anybody that old anymore. So I don't think there's any apostles. But uh, there is another sense in in this word, we are the word. The actual word "apostle" means a sent one, and in that sense, we are sent ones. We're sent to do something. Maybe God's put it on your heart to do something specific for Him in the ministry, and you've been sent to do that specific thing. and And God's given the church people like that, where He's called them to do certain things, called them to be a missionary, or called them to be a, a pastor, and He's sent them. It says he gave some prophets. You know, as far as being a prophet in the New Testament sense, there's two, there's two senses to the word prophet. There's foretelling, and there's also forthtelling. That's, so that's the jobs of a prophet. Now, are there any prophets around today? Well, in one sense, we have 
the completed revelation of God's Word. God's Word is completed, and so there's not really any more foretelling that needs to be done. Uh, if you see somebody who has some extra revelation that's not, that doesn't agree with the Scripture, then that's not a true prophet. You know, that's not a prophet. The Word of God has been completed. The book of Revelation says no one can add anything or take anything away from His Word. And so, uh, in that sense, we don't have the same prophets as the early church did before the, before the New Testament was completed. But we do have people who do what the other role of a prophet is, and that is forth-telling. The Word of God is here, and now it's not just supposed to sit here, it's supposed to be brought out to everybody. It's supposed to be forth-told, given. And uh, God gave some prophets, and we certainly should be doing that. He gave some evangelists. These are gifts to the church. Uh, these are people who go with the gospel message into places where the gospel is not known. That's what an evangelist is. Somebody who takes the gospel and pioneers out into places where the gospel is not known, traveling around, going. And that's what uh, an evangelist, that's what Philip the evangelist did in Samaria. That's what Mr. Pavitt is doing uh, today up, up, up north. You know, he goes and play, preaches the gospel. He pioneers out and, and leads the way. He gave some pastors. We find pastors mentioned next. These, that's the same word as the word pastor, is the same word as shepherd. They care for the flock. They're, they lovingly lead the people as a shepherd would his sheep. They feed the flock. They willingly take the oversight and they serve under the Lord. He's the chief shepherd. He's the chief pastor. But he gave some pastors as under shepherds as well for, for those assemblies. But then what's the next one that he gave? Teachers. Teachers, that's right. There's a ministry of teaching the Word of God, and uh, that means explaining the Scriptures to people. You know how how taking the truth out to this lost and dying world, it needs all of these things. It needs pioneers. It needs it needs these forth tellers. It needs these sent people to go out. It needs pastors, shepherds, but it also needs teachers. People don't know the Bible. We need to. We need the pioneering things. These uh, these guys who came from from neighborhood Bible time, John, um, Andrew and Salvador. They were they called themselves evangelists, and so they really are doing that. They're they're leading people to the Lord for the first time, trying to gather teenagers and young people to the Lord, and that's wonderful. God gave the church people like that, but He also gave people like pastors who are supposed to be the shepherd, who's supposed to help people uh, in their local in a local way, and also teachers who can teach them line upon line, as the Bible says, precept upon precept, comparing Scripture with Scripture, declaring the Word of God to people, explaining it. So these gifts, they exemplify the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the ultimate apostle. He was the ultimate sent one. He was sent to this earth. Jesus Christ was the, the greatest prophet. He, you know, he was the prophet who came to this earth, and uh, he was known as a prophet. He foretold what was going to happen, uh, and he foretold it as well to this lost and dying world. He was the greatest evangelist. He came and he started this church. He, start, he got the beginnings of it together, and he trained the people to keep it going, his disciples. He was the greatest pastor of those disciples. He was the greatest teacher. And yet, we're the body of Christ. We're supposed to be continuing what Jesus started. And He's given us these gifts, these pastors, these teachers. He's given us these things as gifts so we can get the work done. Praise God for the ministry that's continuing here in this world. And what's it for, though? Why did He give us these gifts to the church? Well, verse in verse 11, it tells us what the gifts are. But verse 12, it says why He gave it. And there were, there's a word that's repeated there three times. What, what's that word that's repeated three times in verse number 12? Which word is repeated? It's the word for. The word for. This is why he gave it. For. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of a ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. He gave these to the church for 
the perfecting of the saints. That means maturing in the Lord. So are you growing in the, in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you maturing in the Lord? Are you becoming, it says perfecting. That doesn't mean you'll be perfect. As I said before, there's no perfect church, but there's also no perfect Christians. Some people teach that you can become sinless. Uh, they teach sinless perfection here on this in this life, but the Bible says none of us will be sinless until we are, uh, are uh, completely redeemed up in heaven, body, soul, and spirit. Then we'll be perfect, but it means maturing. That's what that word perfecting means. And we have to yield every area of our lives to the Lord, and uh, He he perfects us. He he completes us. It's about maturing and becoming complete in, complete in Christ. Some people talk about being balanced. Well, the Bible word for that is being complete in Him. And that's what we need. We need to be matured. And then it says, for the work of the ministry. There in verse number 12. So that's the second reason. <coughs> Hopefully, when you come to church, you're becoming more mature. But not just so that you can know more so that you can do the work of the ministry, so that you can do more. And so for the work of the ministry, as the saints are matured and perfected, they do the work of the ministry. And the work of the the people grow, and as the people grow, the work of the ministry should grow as well. So the, the more you're given, the more that's required of you to do. And so as you've been growing as a Christian, are you doing more with that? And so uh, the work of the ministry is done every day, where we live, where we work, where we live on a daily basis, and uh, with the people that we come in contact with. And so as we do these things, how are we going to be able to speak the truth in love? It's not going to happen unless you're growing and you're learning. And it's not going to happen unless you're growing not only in your knowledge, but in your ministry. And so as you grow in your knowledge, as you grow in the ministry, and as you grow in the edifying of the body of Christ is the third thing. You'll be able to speak the truth in love. Do it in the right way. Some people speak the truth. New Christians are very good at speaking the truth. Sometimes they're a little bit overzealous as far as uh, trying to really beat people over the head with it. But, uh, but as you grow, as you mature, hopefully you'll continue in that. That zeal won't diminish, but it'll grow. And you'll be able to do it even more in love, in the right way, in, in, in a Christ-like way. And then, the, as I said, the third thing is for the edifying of the body of Christ. And that means the word edifying, if you look at that word edifying, that word means building up, for the building up of the body of Christ. You know, you, you're building this building, you, you build it up with stone upon stone, you're building something up. The, uh, and uh, then it says, till you come, till you come. Why is he doing all these things? Till, so that you can come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. So the goal is not so that you can, it's not so that our church can be bigger. The goal is not so that our church can, can uh, have, have uh, more of a name for itself. The goal is not so that the pastor can be known as the greatest preacher. It's not so any, any of those things. The goal is God. The goal is that. The, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That was a guy named B.B. Uh, B. Warfield. He used to say that a lot. Our goal is God. Don't make any byproduct to the goal. Because that weakens the goal. If you make a goal out of a byproduct, it weakens the goal. You need to make sure your goal is God. And so uh, that... That we be henceforth no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. God wants us to be strong. That's what He intends for our lives. You know, how can we... Paul took on these huge projects. He attempted these great things for God. It required so much great faith. How is that going to happen? How is that going to work? Well, he says it's only going to happen. You're only going to see God's work done if you get these things right in your life. God's given you everything you need, but you need to become mature. You need to become perfected or mature. You need to be uh, doing the work of the ministry, and you need to be edified or built up. And as you do those things, you'll have the unity that you need to get it done. And so my job, uh, my job is to warn people and, and tell people, teach people. That's, that's the pastor's responsibility. 
but it's also the job of everybody uh, who comes to church. Everybody's supposed to be doing these things. You know, uh, uh, we have to speak the truth. You know, we, uh, we have to do that. And uh, it's so important that we stand up for what's right when the, when the laws are changing in the country. We know what the truth is, but it's not going to work unless we, have, unless we do it God's way, unless we have the Holy Spirit's help. So many people are trying to do spiritual things without being spiritual, you know. But the Bible says, whosoever you, you is spiritual, let him restore such an one. That's an example, but the, uh, ye that are spiritual, restore such an one. There's not going to be any restoration if they're not spiritual people. He says, ye that are spiritual. We have to be spiritual. We have to have the Holy Spirit's help. We can't try to do any of these things in the flesh. And we have to be built up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And as we do that, as the local church does that, it says, then you can not be deceived, you cannot be tossed around, you cannot be shallow, you can, uh, you can, but instead you can go into these situations. Verse 15, speaking the truth in love. You know, this, this world is full of lies, as I said before. This world is full of deceit. What, do we, what does it need? It needs people who are complete in Christ, who are able to speak, who are able to, to know what their job is, who are able to know what God's given them to do, and then being sent out to do it. So hopefully when you come to church, you get that. You get the Holy Spirit working on your heart. You get the, uh, the direction that you need. You get the, uh, the desire that's there. That's the main thing that churches need is people who are willing and yielded to God, who have a desire to want to do what God wants them to do. Hopefully you have that burning desire in your heart uh, right now. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I thank you for the church. I know that uh, we live in a world where, where people are hostile toward the church. We know that's what happened to Paul when he went to Ephesus. But Father, we know that, uh, and Paul knew, that he had the truth. And he had to speak it. Father, I thank you that we know that we have the truth. Help us to speak it. Help us to do it in the right way. Help us to be Christ-like in the way that we do it. Help us to have the Holy Spirit's help. But Father, when we realize we have all those things, help us to have the faith. The faith that moves mountains. The faith that gets your work done. Father, I pray that you'll help us all to surrender our, our lives to you. I pray if there's anyone here who's not a Christian, that they would realize that you died for them, that you loved them, that the truth of the matter is that that uh, there's no way to heaven except, no way to the Father except through the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray that you'll give each Christian here the, the equipping that they need tonight. I pray that if there's anyone here who's, who hasn't surrendered their life to you, who's holding their life for themselves, that they would do that, they would surrender and uh, then they, that, so that they can serve you all the days of their life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we're going to sing page 216. Brother Rob's going to lead us. But are you saved? Are you saved? Are you surrendered? And are you serving the Lord? Those are the things to ask yourself tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest example that we have. He's, uh, he's our Savior, but also He's our example. Let's look to Him. As we sing page 216, look to the Lamb of God. We'll stand to sing in 216, look to the Lamb of God.